Biobalance HealthCast, episode 234, Postmenopausal Bleeding. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast. This week, Dr. Moppin and I are going to be talking about postmenopausal bleeding, what it means, how it's identified, obviously, but how it's identified in terms of causative factors uh, so that they can figure out what's making this happen, why that's a worry for most people, what they do about it, and the, the whole complex issue. Because any woman who is postmenopausal and still has a, has a uterus, a uterus <laughs> who has not had a hysterectomy, uh, is at risk of bleeding. Mm -hmm. And when they bleed, that needs to be understood and treated. And evaluated. Evaluated. Mm -hmm. so, so, so tell me why that's such a big concern. One of the reasons that I wanted to bring this subject up is because we talk about it every day. Mm -hmm. And gynecologists talk about it every day because if you have any postmenopausal patients and they come in and say, I haven't bled for over a year, maybe 20 years, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, I, I have blood that I right. see, and we know it's from the uterus and not from somewhere else. Right. So usually women know that, obviously. Right. So they, they're certain of it. Then we have to say, we're worried about uterine cancer, so, cervical cancer, or some other so kind of cancer. So when a woman says that, she comes in and she says, I'm, I'm having some bleeding. Do you interpret that to be like menstrual flow or trace bleeding or some evidence of blood? I mean, how do you hear that in your mind? Usually the gynecologist asks how much. Okay. Because there's if there's a small amount, that means one thing. If there's a large amount, that means something else. But both things have to be looked at. Okay. Okay. So you because can't ignore it or dismiss it because it's minor. Right, right. If you have not had a period, if a woman hasn't had a period for right. over a, a year, right. and then she starts bleeding, that triggers the doctor to follow guidelines Okay. to then look at what it is and make sure it's not something bad. And the bad is either cervical cancer or mm -hmm. uterine cancer. And those are both really rare. But this mm -hmm. is a standalone red flag that says, stop and pay attention to this. Don't dismiss it. Don't ignore it. Right. And every gynecologist goes, whoa, wait a minute. What did you say? Yeah. <laughs> and, okay, so now it's not just a pelvic exam and a physical exam for the year. It's a problem visit. Okay. And now we have to schedule some things to evaluate this. Normally during a yearly visit, you get a pelvic exam where the cervix is looked at. So... You can tell if there's bleeding from the outside of the cervix okay. by with a speculum exam, mm -hmm. and then the the uh, gynecologist feels the uterus to see how big it is. Mm -hmm. Now, just because the uterus is small does not mean you don't have a woman doesn't have uterine cancer. It means it could mean that if it's large, that would be more likely to be a problem. Yet, you have to put all these things together. You have to put this if the cervical exam is negative and the pap's normal, then you have to think, and the uterus is normal size or, or enlarged, you have to say, what's inside that uterus? What's happening inside the uterus? Because uterine cancer isn't the muscle of the uterus. Right. It's the lining. It's what shed every month when you have a period, when a woman has a period. But after menopause, you don't shed this. Right. This, if you are having a, a uterine cancer, usually it grows and grows and grows until it finally hits a point where bleeding starts. And that's our sign. We need to find out what's going on. And this is, has nothing to do with hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. it this, can happen. this has to do with any woman who's postmenopausal and mm -hmm. begins to bleed. Right. It, it, okay. it can happen without any kind of hormones because right. we still make some estrone, as we've talked about, mm -hmm. from the adrenal gland. And in our fat, we make estrone even after menopause. That stimulates the lining of the uterus all by itself. Mm -hmm. If you're overweight, that stimulates the uterus So, because it's making estrone. So those are our two risk factors, high estrone and being overweight, that would stimulate the uterus itself without ever taking any estrogen. Okay. So what we're looking for is, and, and we rarely verbalize this to the patient, which is why we're doing this today. I mean, because it's hard to the, sit down and have this conversation. When I was, when I was uh, 
just a gynecologist, right. you know, I would I would go through it, give them a handout, give them something to read to try to, because you don't have that long. I only had 20 minute appointments, but some people have seven or eight minute appointments. Right. But the problem is we're looking for the lining to be normal. We want it to be normal. So we look inside the uterus with an ultrasound. So that's now standard. So we look inside, we measure the lining. So the ultrasound will show you the thickness of the lining? Right. It looks, it should be after menopause, four millimeters or less. Five is acceptable. Five and six is rarely cancer. But it should be four millimeters or less. That's that's the goal. So if we have somebody who has eight or ten millimeters thick of the lining, right. then they need a biopsy of the uterus, depending on their circumstances and availability, or a DNC. DNC is opening of the cervix, dilation of the cervix, curatage is cleaning it out, kind of like you'd clean out a cantaloupe. Mm -hmm. You're cleaning out the lining of the uterus. You and then scrape it out. You just scrape it out. You yeah. have a tool that scrapes it out, a curette, yeah. send it to pathology, and then you wait for, for what the pathologist tells you, whether it's benign, no right. cancer, or cancer. Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's probably the gold standard is the DNC, but oftentimes we'll do a little curatage in the office that we get some tissue and then that can tell us whether you have cancer or not. Just a biopsy. Just a that. biopsy. So no anesthesia, no going to the operating room, just a very, a very brief and not very painful, depends on how it's done, but not right. very painful uh, biopsy of the tissue. And if that's benign, then our goal is how do we keep somebody from bleeding some more? If it's not benign, then you go to a hysterectomy. And usually a hysterectomy is curative. Mm -hmm. Usually, if you've just had one or two bleeding episodes, you don't have an advanced cancer. And if they take the uterus itself out, that's all you need. So the, the cancer manifests only in the lining of the uterus. It just builds and thickens and thickens and thickens. Right, and but... when it's too thick, it breaks loose right. and there's bleeding. Mm -hmm. And that's the sign that most women find mm -hmm. that says there's something wrong here. Right, that's correct. So when when somebody, and especially when somebody's not on any hormones at all, right. this, this is more of a warning sign than if you are on hormones. Okay. Because that's more likely to be a cancer if you're not on anything and you're bleeding. Okay. But if you're so, taking hormones, if, if, and especially estrogen, mm -hmm. you're having an estrogen replacement, first, why would you do that? And secondly, how then does that contribute to the possibility for bleeding? Well, estrogen replacement is something that back in, back in the 60s was just given all by itself. We gave, we gave people just estrogen but no progesterone to balance it because estrogen makes the lining of the uterus thicker, progesterone makes it thinner. Okay. So when we give both, the lining of the uterus stays thin and generally, generally, in the perfect world, we don't have bleeding. Mm -hmm. so, so in the 60s, we didn't do that. We just gave estrogen and that's when estrogen got a bad name for causing uterine cancer because it thickened the lining so much that the cells became abnormal. But what else does it do? I mean, why why would you want your lining to be thicker? That's not. Well, you don't. Th this is this is one of the you know you always have reasons you do something in medicine, and then you have the side effects, right. the thing, the drawbacks for doing that. Yes. So the reason you would you would take estrogen would be to stop having hot flashes, okay. so that you could have uninterrupted sleep, so that you could keep the hair in the front of your head, because that it, it you yeah, start you balding see some without estrogen. Ladies that are going just bald, completely yeah. bald in the front, right? And that's loss of estrogen. You want to have um, comfortable relations intercourse. So, right. so that is an estrogen. That's an okay. estrogen. Um, kind of uh, quality. That's what helps us when we're young uh, have all of the, uh, our breath, have nice breasts, have nice skin. We want to have that back. Right. We want to have all those comforts of not being menopausal back. So that's why estrogen. So, so the side effect of estrogen is... Lose it, you want to restore it. Right. You can. Right. And we can. And so the trick is, if you're really thinking about this as I would think about it, the trick is how do we do this the most the safest, the least, the least risky way for a woman, the least bother. Right. Okay. So, so there are some people that think it's easier for the doctor. Of course, if a woman were to have a, a period every month, we can make that happen with estrogen and progesterone, uh -huh. even after menopause. Doesn't mean they're fertile. Just means we're letting the lining build up, and then we're giving progesterone and shedding it. 
Right. Now, that's easy for the doctor because every month it empties the uterus but out. There's a 50 or 60 year old woman. But I don't want to do that. No woman wants to do that. <laughs> I would tell you that no woman wants to do that. Yes. It is not what we want to do. The benefit of having menopause should be not having to deal with periods anymore. Yes. And the reason you re the only reason we really have periods is so we can have babies. Mm -hmm. That's really the reason for it is is monthly fertility. So it re really wasn't built into us to keep us healthy. Balancing issue. It was built into it was built into us for procreation. Mm -hmm. So for for me, that's hard to explain to people because they think, oh well, whatever I was a long time ago, having periods every month, then that was, you know, that that was normal. Well, it was normal for fertility. So having said all that, we say we want to get our our hormone back, our mm -hmm. estrogen back. We want to sleep again. We want to have. Um, uh, vaginal wetness again so we don't want to dry up so we take estrogen well okay so the safest way to take estrogen is non orally okay not really in an oral that? tablet because oral oral estrogen can cause blood clots okay because it makes a lot of estrone okay but patches creams gels and pellets which is what I give mm -hmm doesn't it doesn't increase the risk it doesn't mean you can't ever get a blood get clot, a blood clot right. but it doesn't increase the risk okay you're not more likely to get it because you've used any of these products right okay. right if you're taking non-oral right so so i'm looking for the safest way so the safest way is pick something that's non-oral i've picked pellets mm -hmm. pick something that the patient will comply with because if you take estrogen one day and not the next and, and then you you may bleed just because you're not being compliant or if you have that estrogen progesterone balance where you take the estrogen and then you also have to take progesterone because mm -hmm. both of those systems are not working every single day if you skip a couple of days then You'll you bleed. increase the likelihood you bleed right and so then it's not really a risk of of cancer it's just that you didn't take your medicine so we always ask that question. But the first sign is still, oh my God, I'm scared. This right. is cancer. Right. Yes. Right. I know it is because we've kind of ingrained that into into our patients yeah. just so that they will come in when they have a problem. Mm -hmm. But then that causes overreaction when it's it's a lack of taking the progesterone. So most of my patients take progesterone every night before they go to bed, which helps them go to sleep, but also doesn't give them a lot of progesterone during the day. I don't want them to be, progesterone's kind of relaxing and makes you kind of tired. I don't mm -hmm. want them to be overly tired during the day. So we give it before bed and it does its job and keeps people helps people sleep. Yeah. How do you give that? We usually give it as one of, one of three ways. One is under the tongue, but we've been having trouble finding sublingual is what we call it, tablets that actually give us a good blood level. So uh, trochies are little lozenges you suck on before you go to bed. And then the last is a specific type of oral progesterone that is called BLA progesterone. And it's coated so that it doesn't uh, go through your stomach. It doesn't get absorbed in the beginning of your intestines. It's in the middle. So it goes directly into your bloodstream through the lymph system. So they've shielded it to get through that first pass effect. Mm -hmm. And when the coating is dissolved, then it's far enough into the system that you get the drug you want. Right. And the reason I don't give oral, because it makes more estrogen. The last thing you need is more estrogen. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't want a higher dose of estrogen. We want something to balance it. So that's why I don't give oral progesterone except for BLA. Okay. So we give it all the time. If, you, if I wanted to torture my patients and make them have periods, I would give it to them for a few weeks and then off a few weeks and then they bleed and then a few weeks and off a few weeks. It would keep them or protect them from uterine cancer as well, right. but it would torture them. And, and they still have the whole bleeding issue, which as you say, most women we don't want are tired of it. Yeah, we don't. we don't want that if we don't have so to have it. So sometimes though, bleeding is not a result of estrogen uh, overage or underage. It, right. It, it had other other things can cause it. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily cancerous either. Right. So can we talk about some yes. of those? So when patients come to see me and they're going to get estrogen, they're postmenopausal. I make sure that they get an ultrasound to begin with because I want to know what's in their pelvis because. The lining, I want to know what the line this the lining is that we've been talking about. Is it thick or thin? But I also want to know if they have polyps. Polyps are little like punching bag tissue that lives in the uterus and it doesn't respond to any hormones and it bleeds all the time. 
So if they have a polyp, then I send them back to their gynecologist to get that all cleaned out and remove the polyp so that we can have, they can have their estrogen and progesterone without bleeding. So that's one thing we can fix that. Then sometimes so they- A polyp is what? Is like a, a little punching bag uh, shaped piece of tissue that grows out of the lining of the uterus. It's inside the uterine cavity. You can see it on ultrasound. And, and that's an abnormality of some kind? It's, of uh, yes, it's an abnormality, but not a cancer. It's kind of like a mole. You would have a mole on, okay. on your skin, but a mole that's not cancer. Uh -huh. It's a, it's a, some people make a lot of polyps mm -hmm. genetically. It's kind of like an accident of the tissue. It just, it just makes this little extra little, little bag that doesn't act like normal tissue. So it just, it's fragile. It is, bleeds all the time. Is it similar to a, 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 a polycystic? Uh, no, nope. similar, sim similar to a polyp in the colon. Okay. So that's so why people get colon bleeding. Right, and sometimes they're precancerous, sometimes they're not. Right. But in general, most of them are not. Okay. We just want to get rid of it so that we can give the patient her estrogen without causing her to bleed. Yes. So that's that's easy. A DNC takes care of that. Okay. So the the other problem that can cause bleeding in the uterus is is fibroids or fibromas or leiomyomas. They're all all the same thing. They are benign muscle masses that look like um, have you ever taken the top off a golf ball? You mm -hmm. know, all the yeah. so they they look like that when you cut into them, there's all these different muscle uh, strike yeah, and they're all wrapped around. It's kind of like they they grew from a little a little I call it an itis, but a little center and it, it just kept wrapping muscle cells around it and mm -hmm. get, getting bigger. Well those cause bleeding if they're right up against the lining of the uterus on the inside. So those can cause bleeding, and that is not is not um, managed well with a DNC. That sometimes has to require a hysteroscopy, which is where you go in through the cervix and then cut it out, burn it out, cut it out, right. or it requires a hysterectomy. So are those genetically caused? I mean, are they genetic abnormalities, or is it lifestyle? Is it activity? I mean, They're what? found more the the. The closer your genetics get to the equator, the higher number of fibroids you'll have, basically. So, yes, it's genetic, but it doesn't mean that everyone who has that gene will get it. Right. And oftentimes, high levels of estrogen throughout our lives cause growth of fibroids. And so I don't want to give somebody a lot of estrogen right. who has a lot of fibroids. So what I do is I'm giving them estrogen. I also give them something to counteract estrone which which makes fibroids grow and bleed okay. so i give them dim or i give them a Rimidex. which are supplements that you sell at your office mm -hmm. and Rimidex is a medication it depends on how big they are mm -hmm. sometimes i won't even give estrogen to somebody with a lot of fibroids when they come in i just say we don't want these to grow and bleed and you don't want to have to undergo a hysterectomy because you need estrogen sometimes patients choose to undergo a hysterectomy because they need their estrogen to live normally it's a quality of life issue right so they make the choice that's not my choice to make it's not cancer i don't have to force them or or cajole them into getting a hysterectomy right. that's what they choose estrogen over over um keeping their uterus and running the risk. Right, and running the risk. Yeah. So that's so basically that's the things we look at in the very beginning. So remember, I'm trying to do this the safest way to make somebody's quality of life better. Estrogen also makes your bones thicker. It also makes you think better. I mean, there's so many other things that are not acknowledged as estrogen, um, a reason for estrogen treatment. but. They literally, that hormone literally helps blood flow to our brain and it helps our HDL, the good cholesterol, go up. I mean, many things about estrogen are good for us. Right. Even though there have been studies that have been done on oral estrogens, or I mean, I'm just talking about non oral estrogens, what yes. I use. Yeah, which you say over and over again. What, one other thing I want to ask you about all this, because you mentioned it when, as we were preparing to have this conversation, is uh, a Marina IUD. How does that right. play into this? So, if someone has the inability to take progesterone, because you have to take progesterone if you take estrogen. If they can't take it, if they have side effects from it, if um, they can't get a high enough level or uh, they can't get their uh, blood level up, then we'll, we'll suggest a Mirena IUD, which is 
five years of not bleeding basically we put the IUD is placed in through the cervix and it has a little package of progesterone on it and it just gives you enough progesterone to be inside the uterus it works locally inside the uterus it doesn't give right. you progesterone for most people yeah. throughout your body so in general that works on the uterus and that's really all the reason that's the only reason we're given progesterone is for the uterus right so that solves the problem of bleeding in so most people. It's like a people. time delay capsule built into the IUD. Right. And then and it works for five years and you take it out and put in another one in. They use that in Europe when pellets are put in. Mm -hmm. um, in the countries that use the pellets, use Mirena IUDs so that people won't have to have a hysterectomy. And it does shrink fibroids. It does uh, keep the lining from getting, getting thick. But I want to talk about one other thing. Sure. When we give estrogen, oftentimes we're giving very low doses. Mm -hmm. Now, we give as low a dose as someone can tolerate and still get their symptoms yes. resolved. Yeah. So if they have a low dose of estrogen or, um, and we're giving them progesterone too, oftentimes they'll bleed because their progesterone level is so high. So you can bleed from too much estrogen, which thickens the lining, or too thin a lining because then the inside of the uterus is raw. Yes. It just and, and that's a different kind of bleeding though. It's kind of drip, it's kind of a drippy thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like a usual flow. Mm -hmm. So when it's hard for us to determine without another test, without another, you know, over the phone which you have. So we usually ask about how much progesterone you're taking and did you take it and did you miss it, that kind of thing. And then if you've been compliant, taking it the whole time and we're not giving you much estrogen, we're thinking in the back of our minds, well, it could be because there's too thin a lining, but the safest thing to do is to assume it's too thick, give more progesterone. If that makes the bleeding worse, then obviously quickly we're wrong. Yes. But we're trying to save a three or four hundred dollar test, an ultrasound. Right. And 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 sometimes trial and error is easier. And it's a faster result. Right. You know right away if they start increasing bleeding. Right. If they increase bleeding, then we increase the we give them a little extra estrogen until their next pellets, and then we give them a higher dose of estrogen the next time. Okay. So so that's that's also hard to explain to people because you don't want to say, well, we're doing trial and error. But really, that's what medicine is oftentimes. It's effective balancing. Some people get one antibiotic. I mean, yeah. there's, there are some physicians that or always ADD give or antidepressant ampicillin first, and it doesn't work 50% yeah. of the time, and then you have to go back, and then you have to get a different yes. antibiotic. Right. So we do that. That's not outside of what medicine is. Mm -hmm. But um, but it's very, it, you know, to, to patients who are really concerned about this, it's very hard to calm them down and say, "Well, we're we're doing this unless and if you bleed more, call." You know, we have we say if you bleed more, call back. And then sometimes we get an ultrasound and then say, "Look how thin it is." Right. Now we need more estrogen because it so, seems counterintuitive to them wait, that we're giving them more estrogen and they're bleeding. And you're talking about ultrasounds. Are, are you talking about the same thing that the conservative legislatures are talking about when they re try to require a woman to get a vaginal ultrasound? Oh, is yeah. It? Actually, it is. It's a vaginal ultrasound, but what they're okay. looking for is in pregnancy. Well, yes, I, I know that. They're looking but. for a heartbeat. I'm just looking for the anatomy. It's the best way to tell anatomy in people, especially since um, Americans' BMI have gone up so much because we used to look through their abdominal wall you know, with an ultrasound. Now we have to use a probe that goes into the vagina and looks directly at the uterus. Because we're so fat. Because we can't get through the fat. <laughs> You're right. Okay. But it's a better picture. Yes. So we can get a better, it's a closer picture. It's like doing, having a, um, a magnified lens or something. Mm -hmm. So we can actually see more and we can tell if there's fibroids or polyps or whatever on the inside of the uterus. We can do a diagnosis. It's extremely similar to a colonoscopy which they recommend for people at a certain age and, and then for ever so many years thereafter. Yeah, except that we don't put you to sleep for an ultrasound. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't, I mean, you don't have to be in the operating room. It's yes. done in radiology or it's conscious. done in an OBGYN's office. Right. I mean, I, you know, we but, but as far as getting a good look and looking that's the similar best look. things. Yeah. Not a CAT scan, not an MRI. None of those things see the uterus as well. 
right. as an ultrasound. So a vaginal probe ultrasound is what we use. But we don't want to do that like every time somebody bleeds. That's why we manage things clinically only if we get to a point where we're not sure why they're still bleeding. We've done everything we should do. Then we go and, and look inside to make sure we haven't missed anything. So, so ultimately the point is if you are female and you're postmenopausal and you bleed, that's a warning sign to say, pay attention to me, something is amiss. And mm -hmm. then there are recognized protocols for finding out what that something is and for treating it mm -hmm. so that the problem can be solved and the woman's long-term health can be ensured. And once we do an ultrasound and there's nothing in there, you've got a year of nothing you're not going to be ha you're not going to develop uterine cancer you're not gonna, I mean that's you may bleed again or spot again but it's not something dangerous yeah so we can give you a year of relief after an ultrasound all right thank you for listening email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com you can find the biobalance healthcast on iTunes and on YouTube for more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.